Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar hosted by the 21st Century China Center. I'm Susan Shirk. I'm the chair of the center and a research professor here at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UCSD. Um, thanks so much for joining our discussion today. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website, china.ucsd.edu. Uh, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. Um, uh, I'll be, of course, I'm getting a phone call. Um, Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions, and I'll be reading those questions to submit uh, to Ron Emitter during the Q&A time after he gives his presentation. So uh, it's a great personal pleasure uh, to welcome Ron Emitter to speak with us about his new book. Um, it's uh, great that we're able to use the virtual technology to have him with us, but of course we wish that he were with us in person. Uh, Rana is Professor of History and Politics of Modern China and a Fellow of St. Cross College at Oxford University. Uh, he's the author of a number of books. His 2013 book called Forgotten Ally uh, in the United States has won several awards and shed light on a theater of the Second World War all too often forgotten in this country. His most recent book, which he's presenting today, examines how the memory of World War II and the costly fighting in China during the war is being used today, uh, shaping the way national discourse, nationalist discourse operates in the People's Republic of China. So um, of course, nationalism uh, appears to be raging in China today, and it'll be very, very interesting to hear what Professor Mitter has to say about how the history of World War II contributes to that trend. So he'll speak for about half an hour, then I'll ask him a couple of questions, and then we'll move to questions from the audience. So thanks so much for joining us, um, and please get started. Susan, thank you very much indeed. And it's a huge pleasure for me to be hosted by Professor Susan Shirk, whose work I have been learning from and reading for much longer than I've known her. But uh, as you say, at some point, you know, having done this on Zoom, I hope we'll all have a chance to meet in person and that will be uh, or person again, I should say. And that would be uh, a huge pleasure at some, I hope, not too distant moment. Um, as Susan has said, um, I'm going to speak for a relatively you know, short period, about, about sort of 25 minutes to half an hour or so, because uh, I want to leave some questions, not least since I see you've got what looks to me like a very impressive number of people on, the, on this Zoom. I'm used to rather more kind of tiny numbers on various seminars, so it's uh, a great pleasure and uh, privilege to have so many of you uh, on board for, for today. And I'm going to attempt to make sure our transcontinental technology works for us when it comes to uh, sharing. Could I just check, Susan, that that uh, slide of my PPT? Looks comes good. Out? Looks yep. good. Okay. Good. Fantastic. Okay. So for a little while now, I'll be sharing some slides with all of you in that uh, in that case. Okay. So um, let me get to, to the. Um, oh, okay. Sorry. No, I managed. I think my own technical skills. I had more faith in them than I should have done. Let's keep going. From current slide. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Okay, so there are a lot of things that are associated with Chinese nationalism, a phrase which in and of itself often covers a whole variety of phenomena, everything from fervent and indeed, uh, as Susan has indicated, raging anti-foreignism and xenophobia, to perhaps more thoughtful reflections on the nature of Chinese tradition and culture and how it shapes the nation state identity today. And we could discuss many of those. 
context, but the one that I want to spend a bit of time talking about today and in which Oh dear, we're getting frozen. Rana, we're getting frozen. Um, in the China theater of that war. But it's worth noting that even that's changed its design. It's still generally known, as it has been for decades, as the war of resistance against Japanese aggression or some version of that. Well, my apologies to everyone. We're having some technical problems. Uh, Rana stays. I'm sorry. Uh, you been fro you've been frozen, so I don't know oh. um, if there's okay, sorry, hang on. Let me try again. Uh, okay, how am I doing now? Sounds good. Okay, uh, so well, just check. Can well, you, you, can hear, you, you can hear me now? Yes, perhaps it would be best if you turned off your video and only transmitted audio for now. Good thinking. You don't really need to see my face, I think, at this point. Okay, I will do that. And let's try with the... Um, PowerPoint. The PowerPoint, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Let's go from, uh, go from where we were. Okay. Right, so the event, uh, and sorry, just checking once more, I can now be heard again, yes? Yes, yes. Good, okay, yes, no, even with this wondrous technology, there are occasions when one has to stop and make sure that it's all going, going well. Okay, so the event, which perhaps in some senses symbolized the shift in the centrality of China's World War II experience in its construction of nation state identity in the present day was perhaps the massive victory parade held as you see here in the center of Beijing in Tiananmen Square on 3rd of September, 2015, just over six years ago. This was, I think, and again, those in the audience may want to correct me, but I think is the only occasion where a parade of this size right through Tiananmen Square has taken place in commemoration of an event that is not directly either to do with an anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party or the People's Republic of China per se. In other words, the victory over Japan and victory in World War II more generally in 1945, in that sense, is a pretty unique event to be commemorated with this size of parade. And amongst the events that took place, I mean, obviously, as you see, huge numbers of soldiers from various countries, I think 13 different countries were represented um, there, uh, a lot of weaponry on display. But for those who know Chinese history and politics, and I suspect that's a lot of people on this call, um, one of the most actually poignant moments, but certainly symbolically important, was in the middle when Xi Jinping was presented with a small group of veterans, Chinese veterans of World War II, aged at that point between, I think, 90 and 102 years old. Uh, and I think even since then, most of them have, have passed on. Um, and of course, half of those veterans were from the famous communist armies, the Eighth Route Army, the New Fourth Army, and half from the former Guomindang nationalist armies under Chiang Kai-shek, a gesture of reconciliation that would have been very hard to imagine just a decade or two earlier than this event. But I use this victory parade, this particular event on the 3rd of September, 2015, to symbolize a much wider shift that I'll go on to, to say something about. It's the way in which China's World War II experience has both, has first been prominent, then disappeared and then reappeared in the way that China thinks about its own identity. And it's just worth saying perhaps two or three lines. Uh, I'm not gonna make this a lecture about history, it is about the contemporary side of things. Although as Susan Tidy mentioned, uh, for those who'd like to read more of the history of the wartime period, I have committed a fair number of pages on it in the, in the past. But 
worth remembering that this was a conflict that lasted in its highest phase from 1937 to 45, that led to the deaths either directly or by other horrific means such as starvation of more than 10 million Chinese civilians and military, led to refugee flight of 80 to 100 million Chinese during those years, and not incidentally, led to the Chinese resistance armies of both Kuomintang and communists holding down over half a million Japanese troops until Pearl Harbor, some four and a half years into the conflict, as far as the Chinese were concerned. So these were events of real significance. They are by no means trivial, and yet they tend not much to be remembered in the global history, certainly the work with Western histories of the wartime period. But in recent years, they have achieved much more prominence on the Chinese side. But that prominence did not come immediately because, as I've indicated more than once, and many here will know, a very great deal of the fighting against the Japanese during the wartime years was done by Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists, the Guomindang. This proved the sort of political black hole that was very difficult to fill during much of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s in Chairman Mao's China. We know that there was some minor acknowledgement and commemoration of the non-communist forces during that time, but in terms of the mainstream discourse, the Guomindang contribution, the American contribution, the British contribution, indeed, to the um, uh, victory against Japan was all sidelined to make way for a much more narrow narrative in which the Chinese Communist Party were the only significant actors against the Japanese uh, in the wartime period. So this is very much a story of Mao's People's War that was told during that time. It was not a story about China, particularly under the nationalists, being part of a world anti-fascist alliance. And that was pretty much the tenor of things during that quarter century when Mao was in charge of China. However, things began to shift in the 1980s for a variety of reasons. Some were internal, you might say, to China's recent politics. The, one of the many aftermaths of the horrors of the Cultural Revolution was that very violent class struggle no longer seemed like a powerful enough motivating factor to bring people together and the search for some kind of patriotic narrative that might bring different factions or even past enemies together in some more unitary story became important. And World War II became part of that effort. Beyond that, of course, there was a hope that reunification with Taiwan, still an issue very much today, of course, uh, might be put back on the agenda if there was more acknowledgement of the contribution that the Kuomintang, who had fled, of course, to Taiwan in 1949, had made to that earlier war against the Japanese. And last but not least in that list, it's worth noting that by the 1980s, the market for pushing back against Japan in international society, for China to essentially assert its own world war and essentially remind Japan of its wartime past as part of that sense of China finding its role, that became more prominent in those years um, as well, leading to issues, again, well known to this audience, I think, such as the textbook controversies of the 1980s, when Chinese protesters were very angry about what they saw as Japanese textbooks whitewashing the wartime past. One of the figures, and perhaps a surprising one, who was involved in this shift of viewpoint was this gentleman here, uh, Hu Qiaomu. Uh, many um, prominent roles in the history of the Chinese Revolution. He was Mao's personal secretary. He had been at Yan'an during those legendary years when the party was based in the northwestern base area during World War II. He then became a prominent politician and academician, uh, and indeed historian by training, during the 1950s and 1960s. But he was one of the people who, in the 1980s, actually spearheaded, pushed forward the idea that um, rethinking the history of China's World War II experience was something that China needed to be doing to make its own contemporary political position clearer. He wrote in an editorial published in 1983 in the People's Daily, amongst other things, that the Second World War experience, the war of resistance against Japan, had essentially enabled China to throw behind what he termed the old image of the sick man of the East. This is a phrase that he said would no longer be used after that time. And at that time, quite unusually, Hu Jiamu, in his Renmin Rebao, People's Daily Essay, mentioned a whole variety of post-war changes, including, for instance, the seating 
of Chinese Justice May Ruao at the Tokyo war crimes trials in 1948. In other words, incidents relating to the post-war Guomindang government rather than the CCP government that took power in 1949, all of these were now being brought back into a newly written narrative in which China had suffered greatly during the Second World War period, but as a re result, had just as much of a moral right and um, a right, as it were, gained through blood and treasure to help shape the new world, and particularly the new Asia that was emerging after 1945. So in other words, this is the beginning of a riposte to an argument that was already being heard in the 80s, that if the United States continued to gain dominance in the Asia Pacific region because of what it had done in 1945 by winning the war, well, in that case, China, in this argument, also ought to have that right as well. And as I say, the significance of someone like Hu Jiamu putting these views forward was that he was by no means a dissident, nor was he by any means sympathetic to the old Guomindang nationalists. He'd written very fiercely against them during the wartime years. But he was willing, in terms of building this stronger cross-party patriotic narrative, to bring the Guomindang experience back into the story. And that achieved, if you can excuse the, 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 the pun, concrete terms when one of the first national museums of the war, the uh, uh, museum at Wanping, uh, the Marco Polo Bridge, just outside Beijing, where war broke out on 7th of July, 1937, uh, Hu Chamu was very much involved with advising and approving that particular development as well. So the heart of the reform era 1980s and 90s Communist Party became part of this mission, this um, changing of narrative to bring the World War II experience back into public visibility, not just in terms of the communist contribution, which had been acknowledged under, under Mao, but in terms of it being a bigger story about different groups of Chinese, including the Guomindang, fighting the Japanese, and also as China gaining international moral standing as part of that world anti-fascist alliance that I mentioned. And with various bumps along the way, and there are bumps, I have to say, Broadly speaking, that is a, a narrative which still exists very much in the present day, some 35 to 40 years after the shifts that I'm talking about started to uh, started to happen. So let me move on to giving some examples of what it means in practice, the sort of wider phenomenon that I'm talking about, about the reinsertion of a broader narrative of the Second World War into Chinese definitions, not only of national identity, but also of more uh, pragmatic claims on sovereignty and territory, because it's all very well to say in the abstract, but one has to ask, well, where does it actually turn up in, in practice uh, in, 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 any, uh, in any place? And there are, I should say, before I give you the example uh, in, in detail, quite a lot of specifics in the way that China has in very recent years drawn on the wartime and post-war experience to make its case. It's notable that Foreign Minister Wang Yi over the last two or three years has frequently used the line that China was the first signatory to the United Nations Charter. In other words, taking ownership of an event, uh, the signing of the UN Charter at San Francisco in 1945, which was um, in practice um, uh, almost all dominated by the Guomindang delegation led by T.V. Sung, Sung Zewen, brother-in-law of Chiang Kai-shek. Only one communist delegate, uh, Dong Biwu, was actually there in San Francisco in 1945. But nonetheless, that kind of event now fits into the sort of uber narrative that I've been talking about in terms of the, point, the portraying of China as um, an international actor that was present at the creation to adopt um, Dean Acheson's term in 1945. So let's drill down into one of these wartime events. And the one I'm showing you here is the Cairo Conference, November 1943. And even those who are not necessarily World War II history buffs, I think have become somewhat familiar with this conference in the past few years. Just a reminder, it took place at the end of November 1943. It was one of the regular series of summit meetings between allied leaders during World War II. And you can see from the picture here, uh, we have the, the top leaders all gathered together, FDR just looking backwards, sharing a joke with someone, I think, uh, Winston Churchill looking rather splendid in his uh, safari suit. And on either side of those two Western leaders, 
uh, on um, left, as you see it here, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, and on the other side, of course, Song Meiling, um, Madame Chiang Kai-shek, as she was also known at the time, uh, fluent English speaker, China's window to the world. And in my thinking, and again, happy to get any contradictions from the audience, but my thinking in the first half of the 20th century, only one of two women of global political significance. I think Sung Mei Ling was one and Eleanor Roosevelt is probably the other, but very happy to entertain debate on that subject if, uh, if you want to veer in that direction. Anyway, this meeting was not in terms of military strategy, the most important that was convened during World War II. Tehran, where Stalin was present, he didn't turn up, because of course the Soviet Union was neutral against Japan during most of the World War II period. So Stalin didn't show up for this one, uh, but uh, did appear at Tehran a few weeks later and uh, quite a lot of important um, strategic. The importance of this event is that Chiang Kai-shek appeared as an equal with the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of the British Empire for the first time. And in symbolic terms, as he recorded in his own diary, this is a really very, very important moment for what we might now call global China. In other words, the idea that China was finally being socialized on an equal basis into international society. The famous un unequal treaties, which had been signed from dates dating from 1842, had finally been abolished by the British and the Americans at the start of that year, beginning of 1943. So that century of humiliation, famous term by Nian Guochi, had finally formally come to an end. And that enabled these leaders to meet here as, as equals. So that was something that was symbolically very important at the time. But move on 70 years, move on to the year 2013, when there was tremendous amounts of chatter in the Chinese media, social media, uh, public declarations by diplomats, uh, negotiators, that everyone had to go back to the Cairo conference. Why? Because at the end of the conference, a communique had been issued. And it's not a very long communique, but it has enough ambiguity in it to keep international lawyers going and in very, very healthy fees for quite some time. Essentially, the end of the current communique signed by these three leaders in 1943 said that when Japan had been defeated, which of course had not happened at that point, but they all knew would happen within a few years because of essentially the, the productive power of the United States to keep building weaponry. When that happened, all the islands uh, controlled by Japan since World War I, with the exception of the Japanese home islands, would be handed over to the Republic of China. Now, there's lots of conditions, even in that short sentence, that give, as I say, lots of scope to the lawyers. Since World War I, so of course Taiwan and Iwans around it were handed over before World War I, um, Republic of China, so which country gets to uh, maintain the legitimacy of that particular uh, uh, claim, and you know, which islands count as Japan's home islands. All of this went by way of fueling debate, which again is getting very well known to many of you, the debate over the Senkaku Islands, as termed by the Japanese, Yaoyu Islands by the Chinese, uh, Mafan or Trouble in you know, either uh, conception. Eight uninhabited islands sitting almost equidistant between China and Japan in the East China Sea. And the future of these islands was, uh, or remains very much um, up for grabs as far as the Chinese are concerned and firmly settled as far as the Japanese are concerned. So the Cairo conference, the Cairo communique on its 70th anniversary became another weapon in China's lawfare attempts, as it's sometimes of course um, termed, to try and use what they saw as, or what they argued, was a historical statement of claim made at this conference during World War II. The difficulty of course was that there was essentially China today, People's Republic of China, was seeking to cash a check, which had been essentially written by Chiang Kai-shek back in 1943, considering that Chiang Kai-shek's American nickname during those years was in fact cash by check, since it was felt to be venal and corrupt. Um, that was a rather interesting piece of irony. This claim has not gone a great deal further in international law or international negotiation. But the point is that this particular piece of World War history, World War II history, is being used at as indeed are others, weaponized, you might say, to try and make a claim, which on the one hand forces China in some way to acknowledge the legitimacy of the previous Chiang Kai-shek nationalist government in a way that they wouldn't previously have done, but on the other hand also elide out and smooth all the difficulties that come with the um, problems of claiming continuity with the Chinese uh, geobody and entity that existed 
before 1949, which for so long had been the essential sort of year zero of Chinese history, that everything started again with new China in 1949, and what came before didn't matter. And as I've suggested, this sort of new interest in reviving World War II history since the reform era is not just a matter of the conference chamber or even the history textbook. It also hits popular culture. So a couple of years later for the uh, 60th, uh, no, sorry, 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, uh, this big budget movie, Kailo Xuan Yuan, the uh, Cairo Declaration, was released in uh, movie theaters around uh, China. Um, various historical characters you see portrayed there, uh, Stalin, Churchill, the guy in the middle, by the way, is not Chiang Kai-shek, that's He Qin, the uh, head of uh, China command forces on the Chinese mainland at that time. But there was a certain amount of mockery from the Chinese internet about the appearance in the middle there of Mao Zedong, who, as I'm sure you'll know, was not in Cairo. I'll just show you the picture again. Um, there you are, that's definitely Chiang Kai-shek, that is not Mao. Uh, and ooh, here he is on the movie poster. Uh, the Chinese internet, which I'm sure you will all know, is uh, you know obviously quite heavily nationalistic in many ways, but also doesn't like being taken for fools, started to get very um, kind of sarcastically cross with the movie makers off the back of this poster showing Mao instead of Chiang Kai-shek, and started to produce their own versions of the movie poster. Some of my favorites appear, oh, sorry, I haven't got it, ah, apologies, I thought I had that there. But basically, they produced spoof versions, which you can find online with pictures of uh, Barack Obama, Saddam Hussein, Jack Ma, Yao Ming and various other celebrities appearing where you see Mao there on the uh, the poster, thereby making it clear to the movie makers that their attempt to try and create a sort of sanitized CCP friendly version of history by putting Mao in this Cairo movie wasn't going to wash with all the movie mo goers who were planning to uh, planning to see it. And this sort of expansion into popular culture emerges in lots of other often quite unexpected places in China, not least online. Um, Mingo Shalu, one of the um, better, uh, uh, sorry, Suma Pingba, one of the better known neo-Maoist leftist commentators on Chinese blogs, uh, uh, wrote, uh, co-wrote a very interesting essay, um, still available online, which compared this TV series, the American HBO series, The Pacific, made by Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg, with this movie, Dong Feng Yu, uh, it released in the same year, the year 2010. Um, and this is basically, I've seen it, it's a spy thriller set in sort of that, just before Pearl Harbor in 1941, it tells an entirely fictional, but very, you know, kind of lively story as, as drawn about the um, underground Chinese communist agents who are desperately trying to get information about the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor to FDR, and they managed to get it to the Americans, but what do you know, FDR doesn't listen and Pearl Harbor happens. This story has no basis in historical fact whatsoever, but it's a nicely made movie. And what these two bloggers did was to compare, as I've said, the two productions, the Spielberg hangs, and uh, this movie, Dong Feng Yu, which stars, by the way, a much earlier in one of the earliest uh, roles before and um, tax uh, um, uh, issues, which are, for which he's become more famous recently, and pointed out that both of these stories, the Pacific, a story of massive heroism uh, on the part of US Marines in the Pacific, and then this story about underground CCP agents, are both cultural manifestations of the way in which both the United States and China, in different ways, seek to tell their narratives of World War II as stories about not only their own success in the war, but their own kind of moral standing and values as part of that eventual victory against fascism. And uh, these two Chinese bloggers see this very much part of the continued cultural competition between the United States and uh, China. Other aspects also uh, come to mind. Again, many here will be aware of the famous 9 or 11 dash line, depending which <clears throat> vintage of map you happen to have, which was drawn up in the South China Sea in the immediate aftermath of the uh, Second World War. And I've been recently reading the diaries of uh, Wang Shijie, the uh, nationalist foreign minister between 1945 and 48, who amongst other things records in his diary in 1947, the need both to push back against the newly independent Philippines Republic, but also against the French, whose imperial naval vessels are still very much sailing around the South China Seas and Indochina at that time, in an attempt to try and actually put down the first version of these claims in the South China Sea. And one of the things that I think has become well known is that yet another aspect of the post-war settlement 
which the People's Republic of China has basically taken wholesale from the Republic of China, is that claim to large uh, swathes of the South China Sea space. And that 1947 map is very much part of that. What's worth noting is the 1947 map exists in the first place because of China's ability to make bigger territorial claims as part of its status as a wartime ally on the victorious side in 1945. But of course, at that point, an ally of the Americans, who were perhaps more relaxed at that point about China making big claims, rather than as they later became an ally of the Soviet Union, and then of course a major power in their own right, with a very anti-American bent, which makes those South China Sea claims just much more problematic for reasons I'm sure we all, all know. Let me bring these uh, thoughts to a uh, close with a last line or two, if I may, so that we have time for some uh, q and I'll stop the share since I think I've done the, the slides at that point and see if I can bring myself back up on video. Um, yeah, no, that's great. So what overall should we take from the growth of interest in drawing on World War II perspectives in contemporary China? Well, the first thing I should say is that I've spent the last 20 minutes or so talking about a couple of examples where international maritime boundaries and territorial issues and politics are linked to some of the legacies of that wartime period. But I would say in, in the book, I do say at much more length, that's only one part of a much wider phenomenon. On the internet, there are significant internet communities which you know, spend their time doing verbal and indeed graphic battles with each other, reliving you know, the, the Shanghai warehouse battle of 1937 and working out who went first and who came, came back and forth. Um, there's lots of um, social movements, for instance, the movement that was very big in the, 90, in the 2000s and early 2010s to get those last surviving Guomindang soldiers their pensions, which they had been denied because they didn't fight in the communist armies. This became a quite major social movement on social media, supported by Chinese celebrity figures such as well-known TV host uh, Tui Dongyuan. Uh, who you know, pushed this forward. This was at a time when China's public sphere was a bit more open than it is now. So I'm talking about the early 2010s as part of probably a high point for that. But let me give you one last example, because it's still quite recent, that shows the ambiguity of that relationship that China now has with its World War II experience and that Guomindang versus CCP past that is very much part of the World War II story. Because it relates to just one cultural entity. It's one that many of you may know or even have seen, and that's the movie Babai, the 800. Now, I don't know how many people have seen it. If we were in a room together, I'd ask you to raise your hands, but you may have either seen it or heard of it. Last year, 2020, it was, I think, actually the biggest hit movie in the world, partly because cinemas were closed almost everywhere around the earth, but not in China. And it made $300 million at the box office, which is, is no small sum. It's film IMAX. It's the tale, basically, of a small number of soldiers fighting a last stand against the Japanese in the Battle of Shanghai at the beginning of the wartime period, 1937. But a year previous, 2019, that film, which had been about to open the Shanghai International Film Festival in July 2019, was pulled. It was taken off and banned at the very last minute. And as far as we can tell, this is because this group of very well-connected kind of uh, Hong Ardai, Hong Sandai, uh, you know, red princelings and their kids, connected with the party, said that it was outrageous that a film commemorating a brave battle against the Japanese by Guomindang soldiers, not by communist soldiers, should appear with an $80 million budget on every IMAX screen in China. This was not an appropriate film, they said, for, for the year 2019, that was the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. No way. One year later, in the middle of a pandemic, of course, the movie did you know, gangbusters at the, at the box office. But that, of course, was the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II and the victory over the Japanese. A time when exactly the same film, with exactly the same production, exactly the same actors, exactly the same story could nonetheless be brought out of storage and shown to a public. And while you can do some things for propaganda, $300 million at the Chinese box office, which is fairly commercial, doesn't happen by accident. So that suggests that the demand is there as well as the supply. And that's the ambiguity. That's the difficulty. The fact that this is a popular phenomenon as well as a top-down phenomenon. It is a propaganda phenomenon. But it's also a genuinely felt phenomenon which has to do with the way in which today's emergent bourgeois middle class Chinese still feel some sense of sort of imagined nostalgia for that period when people were deprived, when life was hard in the war, when people were being killed by bombs and invasion. And yet people felt they had a sense of common purpose, which at least for some 
doesn't always seem to be visible in China today. And that ambiguity, that paradox, I think lies at the heart of why 75, 76 years on by this stage, World War II in China is not just history, it's still both internationally and domestically very much part of current affairs. Susan, thank you very much for your time and your audience's time today. Uh, let's hand over back to you as chair and let's have some Q&A. Great. Well, um, thanks so much for a fascinating talk. As, as you were speaking, I was remembering uh, my visit to Pearl Harbor with Jiang Zemin. Uh, during the Bill Clinton administration, I was, uh, you know, one of the welcome party for when Jiang Zemin paid a state visit to the United States in 1997, um, met him in Honolulu, and um, he went swimming in the Pacific Ocean, and also, um, you know, we took a boat to visit Pearl Harbor, which is just fascinating that um, it was seen as a, a very appropriate way to begin his state visit then. And of course, the complexity of the fact that the United States, Japan is such a close ally of the United States and um, how to manage the three-way relationship between Japan, China, and the United States is, you know, continues to be really quite complicated. Um, but I have a question about the contemporary situation with Xi Jinping. I Please. think people would really be interested in your views of compared to previous leaders, Hu Jintao, Jiang Zemin, say, um, and maybe Deng Xiaoping too. Um, how do you see Xi Jinping's handling of the World War II legacy as being different? I, in your book, I mean, which is just chock full of fascinating details as well as big broad brush um, analytic arguments, uh, you mentioned that Xi Jinping has redated uh, World War II in China to make it longer. It's not just eight years from 37 to 45, uh, the Marco Polo Bridge, um, Japanese invasion there, but actually 31, which was the invasion of Manchuria. So what's what's the meaning of that? Is that just to um, to kind of enhance China's status as uh, well the victim of the war, or a ally and uh, one of the victors of the war, or uh, having the status of a global power? So. Uh, what's the meaning of that? And are there other interesting things you might want to say about how Xi Jinping's slant is different from that of previous leaders? Susan, thank you so much. Interesting tied up in that, that question. Um, so I think the answer actually is interesting because it's more complex than a, just a sort of top-down view might, might say. I'm going to be careful what I say because I see that lots of wonderful people, including two brilliant historian friends of mine, Carl Gerth and Michael Muscolino, I see are on this call. You stole them away to UCSD from, from Oxford. We're never quite forgiven you, but nonetheless, I think the, uh, the, the sunshine means that uh, we can understand why they, why they did it. Um, and they, of course, very, very expert historians will, will perhaps be able to uh, correct any, any um, errors of what I, what I have to say here. So I did spend quite a lot of time, and some of this is indicated in some of the notes of, of, of the book where I've had to anonymize for ethical reasons, where I got various quite senior historians in China to tell me frankly, but you know, off the record, what was going on. And the process of political lobbying on this question of how, when was World War II in China, how long did it last, was fascinating. To put it its most basic, because the, the story was sort of long and had lots of interesting highways and byways, it's this. There's been a debate for a very long time, and not just in China, 
about whether or not the start point of the wartime period should be dated from the invasion of Manchuria, the Joey Ba in 1931. And actually Japan for a very long time has talked slightly anonymously about the 15 years war. I've never quite understood how they got 1931 to 45 to be 15, but it is the phrase the Jugonen Senso is used uh, in, uh, in, in Japan. So in that sense, the leftist position in Japan post-war has had that idea for a long time. And in China, there were essentially schools of debate. You know, you would find scholars who quite respectively would say, look, it's an eight year war because the war doesn't really break out to the Marco Polo Bridge incident. You've got armies clashing with each other. You've got, you know, full scale nation against nation fighting. And also for me, this is one of the things that I think is important. The Chinese themselves, both CCP and KMT, always referred to Bani and Kanja, the eight year core of resistance for years and years and years afterwards. So they thought it was eight years long. But the 14 year, Pai faction, you might say, did for some time have the idea that, look, if you're in Dongbei, if you're in northeast China, if you're in Manchuria, you get invaded in 1931, it feels pretty much like a military occupation. Why doesn't that count? And this was a subject of some genuine you know, political debate between both sides. And there was also historical lobbying that went on, I'm told, inside from scholars, but also officials from the northeast saying, look, you know, we want to get our part of this story. Because the thing is that in Dongbei, in Manchuria, not much happens actually during the main wartime years, 37 to 45, because it's already under control as a Japanese client state of Manchukuo. So I think they felt a bit sort of offended at the idea that their aspect of the national story was being downplayed over areas such as the new interest in the Guomindang um, uh, areas. So basically, as an act, you might say, of kind of political reconciliation, the decision was taken at a pretty high level that actually the story of the Northeast would be put into the overall story of the, um, the war, not just as a point of historical interpretation or preference, but as an official mandate. And that was that statement, I think, in January 2018, the 17, one of those years, quite recently, in which it was declared officially that from now on, the war of resistance, World War II in China, is 31 to 45. Xi Jinping made a statement about it. I've seen books being censored in China. I've seen some drafts of censorship where 37 to 45 is now being crossed out and 31 to 45 is put in as the official position on that front. I do know historians, uh, I do not see the names even on a, on a, on a small Zoom, um, in China who are not very happy about this because they feel essentially it's the official imposition of an argument that really should be for historians to decide. But the basic answer is that even historians like to do political lobbying when it helps to bring your region into the yeah. uh, overall narrative that's become important to your country. Yeah, so the folks in Dongbei really like this, and uh, but we don't know. Oh, yes. But we don't actually know for sure why Xi Jinping did it. The specifics of why he did it, I. I could not uh, say in that sense, since unfortunately my interviews didn't manage to reach quite that, that high. But certainly the people I were talking to were, it was made very clear to them that the orders about this were coming right from the very top. You can see that there are, for instance, legalistic arguments. For instance, if there is an agreed state of war, then certain legal provisions about everything from genocide to uh, the restoration of damaged wartime property or deaths yeah. take place. If they take place in a wartime situation, they operate differently under international law compared to if they happen in peacetime. So you can see that if you define what happens in Dongbei from 1931 as being acts of war, then if you get to the right sort of international court, you may be in a better position to make your case. And I suspect that that lawfare element may be part of it. But why Xi Jinping specifically put it forward, I don't know. What I would flag up, though, is in the book, and I think you know, it seems if you've seen that part of it, is that we do have correspondence which has now been opened between some of the previous generation of historians, people like Liu Dapang and Jiang Zemin, whose papers and uh, writing and letters about this whole World War II business are actually available in some part. And it was clear that he was greatly enthusiastic for the uh, Jiang Zemin who you went to Pearl Harbor with. I mean, that wasn't coincidence that he decided to uh, do that. I think it wasn't just the two of you, by the way, Susan. That sounded like a rather nice uh, kind of thing. It was just the there were two other people with you there, I'm sure, at the time. But we've got that paperwork you know, between Zhang and the historians, them saying, look, you really need to push China's role in World War II because Bush is doing it, because Mitterrand is doing it, because Margaret Thatcher is doing it. And it's very much seen in the 1990s as an international um, reinterpretation which China must get a piece of. So we do know that at least one president was very much into the idea.
So um, shifting to the excellent questions from the audience. Um, sure. Carl Gerth, actually, your uh, hey, former. Carl. Yes, uh, he has a question about the um, the fact that in other countries they also are doing much the same. He he asks, how much is this a Chinese story as opposed to a global one? Um, is there a kind of uh, emulation or inspiration by the way other national leaders have their own um, patriotic or he suggests jingoistic kind of view of their role in World War II? Carl, great to have your question. Well, first of all, I'd refer back to that last comment I made when, uh, you know, fascinatingly for me anyway, reading the correspondence of veteran historian Yodapang. And I use the word veteran in two senses because he was in fact someone who had served in the Balujun. Uh, he had been in Yan'an, I think, you know, he'd actually been on the front lines during the revolutionary period. But he was also a professional historian, pretty good one actually, um, and rose very, very high in the circles of power in reform era um, China. So Yodapang was uh, someone who, you know, understood the importance of international comparability. And as I've suggested, you know, was talking or writing, you know, in correspondence with Jiang Zemin about China needing to do what Bush was doing, what Thatcher was doing, what Mitterrand was doing with that wartime, uh, wartime mm -hmm. period. So that is part of it. But let me also flip the second part of your question in a slightly different direction, if, if I may. Jingoism is definitely there. Goodness knows anyone who's looked at, you know, those really kind of appalling, um, you know, evening soap operas about World War II in Chinese TV, which, you know, basically about one grenade blows up, you know, 30 Japanese with one blow of a, a communist soldier's grenade. This sort of thing, of course, is very much the kind of, you know, rah, rah end of, uh, of what's going on. But for me, what's most interesting is the large numbers of ways in which remembering of World War II in China in the last 30, 40 years, let's say, is not so much an argument between China and America or China and uh, Japan or even the communists and the nationalists, but actually a lot of people in China thinking about their own identity and narrative nationalism in that sense of what actually makes up the nation state. Just let me give one example you know, to, to illustrate what I mean. One set of stories that I found actually deeply moving and I was able again to talk to the historians who compiled them was of refugee children who had made their way upriver from Nanjing, Shanghai, those sorts of places on the big Min Minchung steamers to Chongqing and the other interior cities. And they'd never been able to tell their stories, not in public, because they went to the Guomindang areas, the Dahofang, the great interior, not to Yan'an, not to the communist areas. And after 1949, those stories became non grata. They, they weren't really uh, stories that you could tell in a public space and be celebrated and commemorated. In private, sure, you know, granny would tell the grandchildren about, you know, fleeing from an air raid in, in Chongqing or, or whatever, but, but not in, in public. The reclamation of those stories was not about jingoism or nationalism. It was in the words of one of those survivors who told Su Zhiliang, the, the historian I'm thinking of, he said, we're, we're old, we're going to die. It doesn't matter if we, we die, you know, we've lived our lives. But it would have been terrible to die without someone hearing the stories of what happened to us when we were young in wartime. That was what they were worried about, not dying, but not being remembered. And that importance of memory is much more a conversation between the Chinese about themselves and who they are than it is a kind of tantrum being thrown at, at, at the Japanese or, or the Americans. Other things do that, but th this is not that, I think. Um, OK, well, uh, Micah Muscolino, Professor Muscolino or other uh -huh. Uh, another historian here uh, at UCSD who was at Oxford. He uh, asked about uh, historical nihilism, right? So this is a very important political theme in Xi Jinping's uh, era. And so how does historical nihilism relate to the current state of historical research in China on the anti-Japanese war, World War II? Is it, is it a big constraint um, restricting the creative work of the historians in China now? 
Uh, well, great to have the question from Mike, who's written, I'm sure most of you will know this, but if not, please go and check out his wonderful book on the ecology of wartime China, an absolutely pathbreaking book in environmental history. So Mike is someone who knows whereof he speaks. Um, yeah, I mean, how could it be, um, uh, sorry, it's losing the feather, but just the, the, the kind of essence of Michael's question again there, Susan? It's how does historical nihilism... Oh, the historical nihilism, yes, yes, uh, Lisha Suodri. So this phrase, for those who haven't encountered it, essentially is a new sort of relatively new ideological phrase, which essentially covers telling historical narratives in ways that are politically inconvenient. So essentially, if you're thinking about the history of the Chinese Communist Party, and that's really you know, where I think the primary attention of the party ideologists lies. Um, that would mean things like mentioning, you know, the horrors of the Great Leap Forward famine and the millions of tens of millions of people starving to death, or indeed the Cultural Revolution. We're all eagerly waiting, I think, for the resolution, the new third resolution on certain issues in the party's history being issued, I think, this week. Okay. And in that, seeing where the Cultural Revolution stands will be a fascinating exercise. Mike's question is, where does World War II stand in that? I think the answer is in a slightly ambiguous ambiguous position, because it has been acknowledged, and we're not going back to a, a previous version of history, that a lot of other actors other than the Chinese Communist Party were involved in the ultimate Chinese victory over Japan, the Kuomintang, of course, but also the Americans, the Soviets, the British, and the, uh, uh, and the, and the others. And research on these areas continues to operate, but I think the reports that we're getting from inside you know, the academy in China is that it is tougher even now to do very detailed stuff on aspects of the Gomida compared to even a few years ago, because there is more of a squeeze on not talking about the non-communist actors. That said, my strong sense is that when the current uh, PRC regime is trying right now to find a historically resonant conflict that's going to work in, in terms of telling that bigger message, they've almost shifted to the Korean War. Ah. And the primary reason for that, of course, is that it is in Chinese, not Korean War, but Kang Mei, the anti-Japanese or so anti-American or resistance to America, which, of course, fits the current political atmosphere rather more strongly. And there's a new, new movie, you know, Chongqing Lake, there's also documentaries and other aspects of that Korean War are being brought back. So I would say that World War II has been sidelined. It still remains such an important part of the way that the Chinese think about their own experience. The way the Korean War, of course, happened outside their own borders and doesn't hit quite the same sort of, uh, of button, but it is perhaps a little more muted than it was two years ago during the 74th, 75th anniversary. Yeah, we had uh, a very good question about that because the uh, Zhang, Zhang Jin Hu, the recent yep. war movie is about the Korean right. War. That's the blockbuster that now everybody uh, is going to see. So. And these things don't just happen spontaneously, right? You know, I mean, there is some influence on the movie studios and stuff. So it, it maybe is one of these indicators of the political trend, uh, the views hardening toward the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. yeah. So uh, here's another dating question uh, about dates. Uh, James Lee, our colleague here, um, of course. He, uh, he asks whether or not the official narrative in the PRC now considers the century of humiliation to have ended in 1943 or 1949. Or is there any ambivalence about that? Um. Actually, I have to add 1945 to that list uh, as well. And there is, yes, there is some ambivalence about that. Part of what I tried briefly to say in the talk, and I go into more detail in, in, in the book, is about the difficulty of finding the kind of end point and start point for the historical framework that China wants to use to talk about now. And to put it in its most basic, you know, the end point has to be the end of the century of humiliation because then new China emerges and something new starts. And for a very long time, it's very clear that was 1949. That was the Chinese people have stood up, Mao, Chairman Mao has taken over and something new and radical has started. And of course it did, I think there's no doubt about that. But the difficulty and the ambiguity in this new set of discourses is that it's 
Mm. Just tell us a yeah. different story. Not that's not what these guys are about. Could you repeat that? It's about previous you, framework. In which, anyway, you got frozen, so repeat that. Oh, line. sorry. Yeah, this. So it's it's not it's not about sorry. I'll go back again. It, it's not about sort of the historical change for the sake of some form of accuracy, which of course the CCP is not particularly interested in um, at all. It's more to do with the fact that if you want as China to compete with the United States in particular for what you might call ownership of 1945, the moment at which, you know, we still use that expression all the time, the post-1945 order, you know, the post-1945 rules-based order, all these things that we keep, you know, throwing at China and saying, look, guys, you know, you need to be, be doing this. Well, why does 1945 matter? It matters now to China for the same reason that it matters to us. It marks the beginning of a new era in terms of global norms, governance, whatever you want to call it. But for China to be able to claim ownership of 1945, it, I'd say that essentially, yeah, the century of humiliation ends then in that case, because otherwise, why would you start at that point? And secondly, of course, it goes back to having to say that in some grudging way, the previous predecessor regime, rotten, corrupt, and horrific that it was, and historical inevitability means that the communists have to sweep it out of the way. Okay, some of the stuff they did, like getting us a permanent five seat at the UN Security Council and getting China's entry into international society more broadly, we can kind of live with that. Maybe we want to kind of take it over without necessarily acknowledging. Um, I sometimes like to cheese, tea, to cheese, tease my Chinese diplomatic friends, and you made the same sort of thing by asking them if they ever get up and, you know, give thanks to Chiang Kai-shek for getting them that P5 seat on the UN Security Council. And uh, depending how much Mao Tao, they, Mao Tao they've drunk, they either laugh or they look a little bit um, censorious when I, I bring this point up. But it does make that wider issue of why 45 versus 49 has become such an important distinction. Interesting. Um, Susan Puska asks, what role, if any, is the current view of World War II having on messaging within the PLA's professional military education? Have you had a chance to uh, probe into that? I have, since I've had a couple of occasions where I've been invited to the Jin Ke, the Chinese Academy of Social, um, sorry, Military Sciences, not Social Sciences. Chinese Social Sciences too, but that's a little less exciting. I was whisked off the last time, some years ago now, seven or eight years ago, in a uh, black tinted um, kind of uh, Jeep style um, uh, um, uh, vehicle. And at first I thought I was getting a ride in some incredibly sort of high tech Chinese military vehicle. So I asked the Colonel who was taking me, you know, where, whether there was any kind of James Bond style high tech in this uh, black automobile. He said, oh no, it's my wife. She gets much nicer cars than I do. I just use it for kind of weekends. So um, we, uh, we went there and we did have a chance to discuss exactly these issues. Yes, there is huge interest in the PLA in the experience of the war against Oh dear, you're getting frozen, I'm afraid. Um, hopefully you'll come back. Oh dear. Well, um, Professor Mitter appears, his internet appears to have frozen right now. So, um, And we don't see him either right now. So uh, I think I had better bring the webinar to a close. I will reach out to him and thank him from all of us for a really interesting talk. I urge you to um, buy the book and um, you know I'm sure that you'll enjoy it very much. We hope that you'll Join hello. with us. Sorry, can you? Can you hello. Yeah, yeah we I, lost I'm back with you. you. We, we lost Hi. you. Have you got I don't, me back? I don't see you, but I hear you. Um, okay, well, maybe that maybe that's maybe that's good enough for now, since we're probably uh, you know the, the the audio is more essential than the. Oh, I've got video. I can see me. Can you see me? Uh, um. So I see you, but I, um, I think maybe since it's
212 here and we'll start losing a lot of our participants. Would you like to um, finish uh, your last thought and then we'll move to conclusion? I, 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 will, I will do that, Susan. Yes, because I can hear the, 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 the ringing. Sorry, just to remind me, I was just in the middle of finishing, I think, a, a thought. What, what was the previous question? Um, well, that's a good question. I've lost my list of questions here. Not, I apologize. Not not, 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 I'm talking not, about the PLA. Oh, that's right. I was just in my, my lunch with the PLA. Yeah, no, there's a great deal of interest um, in the PLA in this period, particularly on protracted war, for instance, you know, is, is a text that they will still read. But beyond that, actually understanding the reality of what the military tactics were used by all sides, including the Guomindang, is something that actually they examine in, in great detail. And of course, they also have a great interest in territorial boundaries and the historical origins of those. So those maps... South China Sea, et cetera, I think uh, poured over in some detail by the, uh, the PLA as, uh, as well. But yes, there is no doubt that they are very much aware of and interested in both their own studies, I mean, Chinese studies, but also Western studies of this particular period and keep quite a close eye on them as, uh, as well for good or ill, that, that is something that happens. So yes, the PLA definitely have an interest. Well, we, there are a lot more questions here um, I think we'll have to have you back. Uh, there's a great deal of interest in nationalism more generally, as well as the World War II dimension. Um, do you have a new project you're working on right now? I do. I'm looking again at what we generally think of as the Civil War period, in other words, the immediate post-war, but trying to see it through a whole variety of eyes, everything from, I bring a lot of diaries to do with how people felt about being, uh, you know, subjected to new sorts of ideological thinking. And the same, I'm also thinking more about international society, as I think I've hinted a little bit during that, that time. So one of these days, we'd love you to come back and, and talk about the new project as, as well, perhaps a different time, different Zoom, we will see. Okay, well, thanks so much. Thanks for uh, staying up late uh, and joining us. And we really appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you again before too long, especially when we're able to start traveling again. Huge pleasure to see you, Susan. Thanks for seeing old friends and new ones too. And I hope to see you all in person one of these days. And I'll say good night from Oxford. Okay, thank you. And uh, now to our participants. I'd like to invite you to join us again. We have a lot of very interesting talks coming up um, on December 2nd, John Yasuda on uh, the state stock markets and growth in East Asia, and uh, Jessica Teets on December 9th. Um, I don't see the Jessica Chen Weiss talk. I guess that's a smaller seminar. Um, but uh, keep checking the china.ucsd.edu website. I think you'll see a lot of interesting talks for those of you who have an interest in China. Thanks to all of you who participated today, and we look forward to seeing you again before too long.